Hello everyone, welcome back. We are in the fourth lecture of this uh, last module and in this uh, lecture let us continue our discussion on different applications of reliability based structural design. We have seen that reliability problem is nothing but an optimization. So, uh, optimization plays a vital role in the reliability based uh, analysis of structure. Now, uh, there are different options for optimizations are there. So, uh, we will not go into the details of that, but uh, we will uh, see how we can actually um, use uh, constraint optimization and uh, that we introduce in the framework of reliability to solve reliability based design problem. So, that is the main aim of this discussion because uh, whenever we uh, will uh, apply this reliability theory, effectively what we have to do is to opt for this uh, optimal solution and that is the reason if we uh, go for reliability based design of any structure, uh, we need to handle uh, constant optimization. Now, um, why we do optimization? The simple reason is it gives a better design uh, when we uh, have multiple variables to deal with that may be uh, design variables, maybe some random variables in our case when we talk about uncertainties. So, uh, using this framework, we get a uh, better uh, design that we will see as we progress how we can improve our design through this optimization. Now, uh, in this uh, process, what we need to do is basically we have to uh, minimize uh, uh, objective function and then uh, in that minimization, if we have no other condition, that is an unconstrained minimization. But in reality, we need to satisfy different uh, conditions. For example, you can see this first uh, uh, equation here. So, uh, this minimization is subjected to say g j of x less than equal to 0. That means, this is a, a limit state. It actually defines the performance um, when we have uh, different variables and some of them may be uh, random variables too. And in reality, we can have multiple performance function. In fact, if you recall, when we uh, studied uh, subset simulation, at the end of subset simulation, I showed you uh, one paper where actually multiple uh, limit states are used and using that actually the uh, reliability problem is solved and also structural optimization was proposed. So, we can have in reality multiple limit state functions defining different performance criteria. Then uh, we can have some uh, equality constraints also and then we can have some bounds for the variables uh, that we use in this optimization process. So, that makes the most generic statement that we can imagine in case of a uh, optimization. And uh, in this format, this x is basically the vector of uh, design variables that we will get as a solution of this optimization process. And once we satisfy all these criteria through this constraint optimization, then actually we meet the performance requirements. We do not just uh, select this from a particular analysis, but through the satisfaction of this performance criteria. And that is why constraint optimization is so important. And you can broadly classify them into two major subgroups. One is what we call direct and another is indirect approach. It is uh, actually based on the way we handle the constraint equations. Now, uh, when we talk about solutions, there are different solution techniques available. Uh, for example, gradient projection algorithm, Lagrange multiplier, we have already studied this when we solved the first order reliability problem. And there are other options also available. For example, uh, feasible direction, then interior and exterior penalty point approach, and then obviously sequential quadratic programming and the list continues. This is not the exhaustive list. Now, in this uh, brief discussion on optimization and how we can bring in this concept in our uh, reliability based uh, design, we will only discuss interior penalty approach because of some merit of this approach. Uh, in this approach, actually, uh, the solution always remain within the feasible domain uh, if we start uh, our optimization process with an assumption which is well within the feasible domain. And uh, in this process, actually, what we do, we combine all these into a new function as you can see here and then we actually minimize this function to get the optimal solution for this fx. So, what we do? 
we have this uh, objective function and we have some constraint conditions through that we define this penalty function and then we actually construct this uh, new uh, function to be optimized and effectively we convert this constraint optimization into an unconstrained optimization and that's how the penalty is uh, handled and this is the reason uh, our method comes under this indirect approach and uh, this uh, rk this is a constant it is uh, a penalty parameter which is always positive so with that statement we can actually solve the problem and here are the steps when we solve the problem so we first initiate with a guess and the uh, value of rk initial guess of rk which is uh, always positive and uh, typically its value ranges from uh, 1.1 to 2 times the original uh, effects that we evaluate at the starting point so that's a just a guideline a thumb rule uh, that we can start with nevertheless our main objective is to uh, initiate the process with a good guess which is well within the feasible domain uh, and within that domain our task is to find out the optimal solution so once we do that then next task is to formulate that unconstrained problem and for that we actually construct this f function and once we have that then we can uh, solve using any standard algorithm just like we did in case of uh, first order reliability analysis through uh, Lagrange multiplier technique now once we do that at the end of this uh, solution process in an iterative framework what we get is the new uh, point and in this uh, new design point we actually uh, evaluate from the last point that uh, we used to initiate the algorithm now here you can see these two uh, parameters s and uh, gamma they are basically the search direction and the step size we use and then once we do that we find out the new design point our uh, remaining task is to check convergence if uh, the difference between uh, the two solution is in, in two successive iteration is well within the tolerance limit then we can terminate the algorithm otherwise uh, we actually improve this penalty parameter and then we go back to the step two and the process is repeated uh, until and unless the convergence is achieved so that's how the algorithm is uh, implemented so let us quickly take a example so here we have a function to be minimized so you here you can see 1 by 3 times x1 plus 1 whole to the power 3 plus half x2 square plus half so that's the function we want to minimize and we have uh, two uh, conditions to satisfy so g1 uh, is minus x1 plus 1 less than equal to 0 and g2 equal to minus x2 less than equal to 0. So that uh, actually gives us the performance criteria and then uh, if we go for this optimal solution our first task is to convert this into an unconstrained optimization and this is how we actually uh, develop that uh, new uh, or modified unconstrained objective function. Then we start with the initial guess so what we do we start with this point 2 comma 1 and then uh, we start our iteration so first we assume this penalty parameter to be 10 and then uh, what we do we find out this f at this initial value and what we get here and using this that information we can further um, differentiate this function to find out the search direction so if we differentiate this capital f the unconstrained uh, problem with respect to x1 and x2 and then uh, we put the values we get the um, gradient so in this case it is minus 1 and minus 9 so we get the gradient vector now obviously the search direction will be the negative of this gradient vector so we get the basically the capital s and then uh, once we do that uh, we get the new design point uh, you can see it is in terms of uh, this gamma that uh, constant uh, and then what we do uh, we put it back in this original function f and then with respect to gamma we differentiate this function and equate it to 0 because we have to find out this uh, gamma that is the um, step size so uh, that's the solution and once we do that then using these information we can find out the next design point so our new design point is in this case 2 plus gamma plus uh, and 1 plus 
uh, nine times comma. So if we do that, we get the solution here. So that is the new point. And then we find out the difference between the previous and the new point. And then if it is less than the tolerance, so in this case, we use a tolerance of 10 to the power minus three. So uh, if it is less than uh, the tolerance, then uh, we stop the iteration. Otherwise we continue. And in this case, if we continue for five iterations, then after the fifth iteration, we get the optimal solution for X. Now here, the optimal solution of X is 2.0401 and 3.1622. Now, this example gives you clear idea how using um, a penalty function, we can actually solve the constraint optimization problem. Now with that, uh, and our background on this uh, reliability analysis and different modeling, let us see further applications. We will solve some reliability based design where we will introduce this concept uh, of optimization and we will see how we can improve the design of a structure. So, uh, if we take the first example, in this case what we have is a bridge. Uh, this is not a reliability problem. Recall uh, in the subset simulation we actually talked about uh, uh, structural optimization also. Here, the first example is structural optimization and then we will introduce uncertainty within this framework. Now, this is a bridge uh, railway overpass uh, and then it is actually a box. Uh, it's an eye guarder. You can see here the cross section of the bridge. And then uh, this bridge is uh, uh, having two lengths and at the center line, this is separated. So actually the deck is con not continuous. So there is a gap. And uh, the test result uh, I will show you here is actually on the left hand side of this bridge. So we put some sensors uh, on the bridge and then uh, use some track load to see the vibration level. Now the main objective for this is to uh, see the in situ structural health. Uh, so what we do when we have this kind of problem, so we have an existing structure and uh, once it is constructed in left uh, uh, for its operation, then over the years, actually there can be a lot of detrimental effect and then uh, that reduces strength. So periodically we need to go for um, uh, see this structural health monitoring and there uh, we start with a model. So for this, uh, we first create a bridge model and here you can see we have this longitudinal girders and then cross girders and that's how this uh, bridge frame is created and on top of that there is a bridge deck. So normally what we do, we uh, use different softwares to model this kind of bridge and do the uh, analysis, either static or dynamic. So in this case, we use ANSYS to model this bridge and uh, this bridge is uh, modeled using beam and shell elements. So that gives us the model as per the drawing for this bridge. Now, remember this drawing is created when uh, even the construction uh, was not done. Before that, first the structural drawing is prepared and according to that drawing, um, the construction is carried out and then uh, the bridge is left for operation. Now, what happens over the year if there is a change in frequency, uh, change in material property that will be reflected in the vibration characteristics. And if there is, for example, say a damage, uh, definitely that is bound to affect the mm, stiffness of the structure. And uh, if you recall, when we discussed uh, load models, we said that the um, dead load of the structure is not uh, affected uh, by great extent. So only uh, the stiffness of the structure is uh, uh, reduced over time. Then if that is the case, what happens? The vibration characteristics changes. And uh, if we see the vibration modes, that is the natural frequency and mode shape, and also the structural damping, it is uh, these structural features that will be affected by the deterioration. So now if we have a finite element model, which again gives us some say natural frequency, say uh, uh, let us take an example. If we get the first natural frequency from the software, say 2.5 hertz, then uh, that should match with the actual in situ uh, natural frequency of the structure. So for that, what we do, we put some sensors 
as we did in this case and then uh, once we put the sensors and run a vehicle over it then we can measure the vibration and that from that vibration if we do some signal analysis then we can identify what are the structural frequencies of course uh, when you load a structure and you allow it to vibrate then in the response you will get modal frequencies as well as the forcing frequencies but there are techniques actually uh, to identify out of all those possibilities which one is the modal frequency and which one actually coming from the uh, loading condition so uh, that is also carried out here and from the field we measure the first few natural frequency of this structure now the next task will be to create a model which can give us this uh, measured uh, structural frequency uh, at site then only we can use that uh, finite element software for further analysis say if we do a reliability analysis first we have to have the best replica of the actual bridge in terms of finite element so that's why uh, model updating is so important when we have uh, finite element analysis uh, of a, a actual structure so in this case the bridge uh, is having three independent spans so the central span only of this bridge is uh, censored and then we measured the response it has two uh, other spans and uh, it is not a continuous span you can see here there is a discontinuity so uh, only the central span uh, which is supported at these two points uh, over bearing and that is used for model update and uh, it has a, a two-way traffic flow and uh, the lane width is 7.5 meter as you can see here also then uh, what we have in this model updating we have the frequencies estimated from site and then frequencies from the FE model so this FI is the natural frequency of the structure with this uh, this sign uh, it is the natural frequency from the finite element so the first uh, FI if I had this is the uh, natural frequency from the FE model and the second one is what we get from site now when we have a finite element model we get uh, as many frequencies uh, as many uh, degrees of freedom we have in our model but when we go to the site and test it not all the frequencies we'll get we'll get only the first few dominant modes and that's the reason you can see here so if id is the identified frequencies so we can consider them to be as benchmark so our model whatever we create in finite element that should replicate these frequencies and then only we can use that model and that updated frequencies are here so for that again this is the error function we have in this case and we actually minimize this error with respect to the uh, variables in this case we consider the material properties we use for finite element analysis as the uh, design variables which we have to reduce because uh, it is an existing bridge and maybe the for example Young's modulus uh, what was assumed by the designer is not reflected on site and that's the reason there is a difference between the uh, model as per design and the existing structure so what we did uh, we used uh, response surface based optimization and for that uh, we need to first uh, use some support points and based on that support points we actually uh, replicate this error function and on top of that response surface we did the optimization similarly we uh, solved the problem of reliability analysis using response surface here in this case instead of reliability analysis we go for um, model updating and the updated mode shapes also you can see and once we do the model updating you can see you can compare the natural frequencies and now the bridge natural frequency is uh, closely matching with the identified frequency once we do that uh, we can use this model after this uh, optimization and for this type of problem when we have a finite element model and a field data then uh, this response surface based approach uh, is a very efficient technique and we can easily solve that and here you can see the objective function this is the error function so you can see the nature of the error function it is 
minimized at this uh, location so over this uh, we can consider the solution and in this case what we did the design variables we optimized is Young's modulus and density obviously the density of the material doesn't change much uh, so we can fix that we can in fact take some samples from site and we can measure the density at site uh, sometimes also the construction data available from that also we can identify what is the uh, density of concrete exact density of the concrete used at site and corresponding to that we can identify what is the in situ Young's modulus that we get so once we do that then we can update the model and here you can see the result so in this case uh, we develop a mls uh, response surface this we have already discussed how to uh, create the model using response surface and then what is the advantage of mls and then also we can use a gradient based algorithm uh, and then we can see the result and as we increase the iteration we can see how uh, this uh, mls based solution is actually coming uh, to a converged value so that gives a clear idea and in this uh, meta model based optimization uh, then what we do we can uh, compare the performance of different meta model based approach recall when we construct a response surface we first uh, create the support points and here you have that is what we call design of experiment so here we have different support point schemes uh, that we can adapt so uh, ccd uh, d optimal kushal these are the different support point generation schemes and once we do that we can also change the basis function so we can go for linear or quadratic basis depending upon the type of surface we fit and then uh, we can go for different regression analysis also so we have linear uh, uh, least square approach and then we have moving least square approach uh, so obviously moving least square uh, performs better compared to uh, its uh, linear variation uh, normal least square uh, and then in the moving least square also we can use different types of weight functions exponential weight and regularized weight and uh, for some problem uh, exponential weight performs better some pro other problem regularized nevertheless <coughs> excuse me uh, this uh, mls based response surface uh, actually provides better solution compared to uh, other type of response surface and what it uh, this problem shows that we can adapt this to optimize the design variables So the next example is uh, reliability based optimal tuning of controller now in this example what we have is a SDF system and this SDF system it's a mass spring and dash pot uh, it is exposed to a support condition support excitation uh, here is the acceleration at support and then uh, we have a passive controller here now a small TMD uh, is fixed over this structure and uh, when we tune the natural frequency of this T TMD with the natural frequency of the structure then obviously uh, resonance will occur and because of that resonance uh, this uh, small TMD it works as a vibration uh, controller and this small TMD uh, absorbs a good amount of energy because of resonance and that's the reason uh, the response of this uh, is suppressed to a great extent and that's how a passive controller works now when we have a uh, ideal case obviously we can tune this uh, in a deterministic framework ideally speaking uh, if damping is not there if the natural frequency of the main structure which is ks divided by ms square root of that that is the natural frequency of the primary structure and if we equated that to the natural frequency of the tmd which is kd by md square root of that uh, if we equate these two we will get uh, proper resonance now if we have a damped case obviously it will be slightly uh, in a uh, close to one but not exactly one so that you can see here so we have an input which in this case is a, a white noise and then uh, we have some kind of psdf uh, and then if we apply that uh, psdf 
of the input uh, excitation, then we get the output PSDF. And if you look at the output PSDF, if we have without TMD, that means if the structure vibrates, then the amplitude of vibration can go here. The moment we tune uh, this with the natural frequency of the primary structure uh, with TMD, the response gets suppressed. The point to be noted here, you can see the natural frequency of the structure is around 10 uh, radian per second. So obviously, when we tune in and around that frequency, then we get a good amount of vibration reduction. And in fact, this is in uh, 10 to the power minus 2 and minus 4. So if you find out the num uh, amount of reduction, it is a significant amount. Not only that, what you can see, the moment we put a TMD here, then uh, that TMD makes this system as a two-dof system. So we have two uh, peaks here representing uh, two-dof system. And that's how this passive vibration controller works. Now, uh, what are the parameters that we need to design for tuning? So we have some design variables. Obviously, it is the parameter associated with the passive TMD. Mass of the TMD, that is the first parameter we need to tune. Uh, we cannot uh, put a huge mass on top of a primary mass. Ideally speaking, this mass is uh, in and around 1, 1 1.5, maximum 2%. We do not go beyond that. So, once we select the mass, next is uh, we have to select the uh, spring stiffness because that is how the uh, frequency of this controller is uh, decided. And of course, because we have a damped vibration, the damping of the passive TMD also is the design variable. So, these are the design variables. And what are the random variables in this case we used? We have the amplitude of excitation here is random and these are the primary structures they uh, uh, we have considered to be random. Now, the moment we do that, obviously, you can see the tuning of this controller is so difficult. For that, uh, we set a performance function. What is that performance function? So, sigma s is the root mean square value of the response. Now, there are some standard techniques to find out uh, this uh, solution, u s of t, that is the primary response, using random vibration theory that we are not going into the details, but for the time being, you can assume that uh, we can definitely find out the solution in terms of power spectral density. So, if you have this power spectral density of the output, area under this curve, gives us the uh, root mean square value. So, um, actually the mean square value and from there we can find out root mean square value. Now, uh, if we have uh, two cases, one is the uncontrolled case, that is when we do not apply this controller and then we have a controlled case. So, the ratio of these two is basically the performance function and if we reduce this function as much as possible, we get a better controlled response. So, that is the objective of this uh, vibration controller. So, then what we do, we can actually uh, solve it in deterministic framework when there is no uncertainty. And in the second case, we can actually consider a problem where we have uh, design variables, we have random variables, we have identified these variables and then we can set some performance criteria and based on that criteria, we can actually solve this problem. And in that process, as I said earlier, we can also set some limits on these variable because these design variables and also the random variables, uh, they cannot arbitrarily take any value. So, they can be bounded within some limit. Now, for that, uh, we can still use response surface approach to solve this problem. So, in this case, first we have to find out the response of the primary structure and from there, we can act, uh, we have to estimate this uh, root mean square value. So, if we use standard random vibration theory, we will directly get this uh, solution, but that also we can do because we have these uh, parameters are random. Obviously, for every case, we have to solve this or otherwise, we can uh, uh, fit the response surface and in this case, we have two steps. First, we have to get the solution of the structure and then we have to minimize that. So, we have two sets of response surface. The first set of response surface deals with the uh, objective function uh, and then uh, for every support point we have, we fit a surface here and for every point, we need to now identify the uh, RMS response of the structure. So, for that again, we fit another uh, surface 
uh, and then from that we find out the response characteristics and that can be adapted to solve the complete problem. So, it has two sets of response surface dealing with uh, the optimization and at the same time uh, the performance evaluation in terms of uh, the random variables we have here. So, both of them can be done using uh, two sets of response surface uh, in MLS framework or in other advanced version that we have discussed and uh, that is how the logic goes. So, here is the uh, algorithm. So, the first part when we initiate the optimization, we first need to evaluate the response of the structure and then once we do that for every uh, samples of the random variable, then we go for the optimization. And then once we combine these two loop, see the inner loop here that gives the response of the structure and the outer loop actually performs the reliability based design optimization. And then once we do that, we get basically the optimal design. Now, here is the uh, results from that optimal design. So, uh, we can adapt MLS or LS and here you can see the advantage of using MLS. In this case, because we use a moving least square and we control the error uh, of modeling through a weight function and that weight function is localized at a certain point. So, we have these support points and the weight functions are localized and you can see all these points are properly mapped and we create a response surface. Now, if you go for a regular LS, obviously it will have a global match and that reason uh, you will not uh, get a surface which will pass through all these points. Obviously, if we do an optimization over this surface, it will be erroneous. And uh, on the other hand, if we use uh, MLS, uh, we will get a better uh, result. And in this case, we use CCD scheme. So, these are the support points uh, in three dimension. So, if we use a CCD scheme, we have uh, 2 to the power n plus 2n plus 1. These are the number of uh, support points we have. And then uh, these are the variables, these are the random variables we have, the means are given. So, these are the random variables and the design variables are basically the tuning frequency and the damping of the TMD. And of course, there are some limits, uh, upper and lower limits for this uh, problem. Then, uh, this is the result. So, here is the objective function when we solve it in the deterministic framework and you can easily sense that uh, we have around 0.9, we have the optimal solution or 1. Uh, so, here in this region, we have the optimal solution. Now, if we go for a deterministic design, obviously, uh, we will uh, employ resonance and then using that resonance, we absorb uh, uh, vibration energy from the primary structure and that is how a passive TMD works. And for that also, we can find out what will be the optimal damping of the TMD. Now, the moment we introduce uncertainty, some variable will be now random. Obviously, this is not the best point. As you can see, if you apply a small perturbation, then the performance function value uh, abruptly changes in this vicinity because that is the deterministic optimization point. And the moment we introduce uncertainty, obviously, the controller performance will vary if we tune at this particular point. So, that is the difference between deterministic tuning and the moment we introduce uncertainty in the system. So, we have to tune at some other place where if we apply small perturbation because of the uncertainty, then there will be not much variation. And we will see in a minute how the deterministic result and the moment we introduce uncertainty, the optimal point changes. So, here are some of the results for different level of coefficient of variation. And the moment we increase the coefficient of variation, you can see the simulation and the response surface based analysis, they match closely and there is a significant difference between the deterministic design optimization and the uh, stochastic case. And that is precisely as I explained, the moment we use the deterministic optimization point and then introduce uncertainty in the vicinity of this point, the change in uh, J function is really very high and that is what is reflected here. Now, if we see the optimal solution, so the first uh, is uh, uh, deterministic design optimization and as you can see, it actually traces the optimal point. 
So that's the deterministic point. It uses resonance. So that is the ratio of the natural frequencies. So uh, frequency tuning parameter. It is in and around uh, 1. It is not exactly 1. It will be somewhere between uh, 0 0.9 to 1. So it will be roughly 0 0.99 or 97. So that's the deterministic design point. And at this point, as I have explained, that the moment we introduce uncertainty, uh, a significant amount of error uh, we get in the performance. For that, we go for uh, reliability-based design. And you can see the reliability-based design is actually uh, somewhere away from this deterministic design point. And if we tune here, if you look at the uh, surface, uh, a small uh, change in uh, some variable due to uncertainty will not change the performance function much. So, the moment we tune it here, although it is not the deterministic design point, but interestingly, you can see still it uses resonance and more or less it uh, is on the same line of the tuning frequency, but it only controls the damping and that is how it identifies the new design point where if we tune the controller, then obviously the uh, RMS response of this performance function will be controlled. So that is how actually the reliability based design uh, works in case of um, uh, practical problems. Now here are some of the results what you can see uh, the moment we introduce uh, this reliability based design optimization the beta uh, it actually is uh, significantly more than what we have from the design optimization. And this is the error function plotted and we can identify the location where we have optima and uh, that also we can repeat when we uh, change the coefficient of variation. So that completes the uh, first part of the problem and we can ex extend this for MDOF system. So here we have the MDOF system and that is tuned by a controller. Obviously, we have a single controller. So the dominant uh, mode, first mode, we can uh, control using this. Only one frequency can be controlled. So, in this case, again, we can repeat the same. So, we will not go through the complete solution. But the point I want to show you is that the moment we introduce uncertainty, see the transfer function here, frequency response function, and you can see the variation in the frequency response function the moment we have uh, uncertainty in the system. So, these are the random variables. If we model that as a random variable, then the moment we do that, uh, the frequency response function uh, actually has that effect. Now, out of that, this black line is the deterministic point and then uh, this uh, control line when we use the deterministic point. But the moment uh, we introduce uncertainty, uh, you can see the response varies significantly. So, if we have this type of situation, then uh, deterministic tuning of the controller will not work and uh, we have to uh, consider the uncertainty and then accordingly we have to tune the controller to get the best performance. So, that is the uh, first problem and then again in this case uh, when we have uh, say uh, performance function in terms of the ratio of the RMS values uh, that j, j function it has a mean and it has a standard deviation also. So, if we sometimes we have conflicting uh, optima so for that we can uh, generate the Pareto front and then using that Pareto front we can still uh, tune the controller. So, in this case mu of j and sigma of j we estimate and then uh, uh, we uh, tune that accordingly and then this is the optim Pareto optimal front and on top of that any point we can select uh, here are the different options. So, the moment we consider uh, Reliability based design optimization, you can see we are uh, mostly on the Pareto front. So, that is how also we verified the performance of this reliability based tuning, whether it is giving a right answer or not. So, uh, that uh, gives a complete idea how reliability based uh, design optimization can be used. So, the question before we uh, move to the other problem, the question is what is the uh, uh, mathematical uh, I mean operation that it does through reliability based design optimization and that is reflected here. So, if we find out 
the PDF of J, that is the performance function, the ratio of the two RMS values, and then if you plot it, here you can see the PDF of J. The moment we consider the deterministic design, that is the uh, dotted line you can see, in this case, obviously, the performance limit is J equal to 1, and beyond that, this is the failure regime. Now, in case of deterministic design, you can see it is spread over a wider area. And the moment we introduce the reliability-based design optimization, that is this blue line, and the moment you introduce that, this area is squeezed. So, the uh, variance of this uh, PDF that we obtain through reliability-based design optimization, it is actually reduced. And that's the reason we have less amount of area beyond this performance limit. And uh, if we find out the reliability index for different coefficient of variation and different mass ratio, that is also reflected here. And you can see always uh, the moment we use reliability-based design optimization, then we get the best uh, estimate of uh, reliability index. We have more reliability index compared to other. And that's why we have a better uh, performance robustness the moment we adopt RBDO. So that's how this uh, reliability-based design optimization works uh, when we apply for a particular structure. Now, in our next example, again, it is a multi-story portal frame. So in this case, uh, there are lateral loads and the performance is governed by the lateral uh, deformation at this point A. So, we have a allowable deformation and then we have uh, the lateral deformation due to this uh, load application. And uh, we have a few uh, random variables that are identified here. So, different parameters related to Young's modulus, uh, moment of inertia and cross section for this frame, they are random variables. So, the properties of the random variable given here, altogether in this case, we have 21 random variables. This problem is taken from a research paper. And then uh, the PDF of this, you can see they are non-normal. So, for that, again, we can easily adapt uh, a response surface-based metamodeling. And here you can see the result and uh, the amount of error we get from different modeling approach. And also you can see within this bracket. So, we solve this problem using first order reliability method, second order reliability method and all other response surface based approach. So, we compare the results with HOSRSM and uh, sequential SRSM. Recall uh, this uh, SRSM that is using Hermite polynomials and uh, this HOSRSM uh, also taken from the uh, published paper. And uh, obviously, the moment we go for gradient based algorithm, if we have large number of random variables, we very often encounter a significant amount of error as you can see. And from there, if we introduce a orthogonal decomposition of the response surface through some uh, orthogonal polynomials, and if we sequentially, that means if we adopt moving least square approach along with the orthogonal polynomials, that's the best combination. And the moment we introduce that, you can see the amount of error in the modeling, it reduces. So, uh, the reliability index or for that matter, the probability of failure we get, it perfectly matches, uh, closely matches with the uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So, we use different allowable deformation limit. So, that we increase and as we increase, obviously, we estimate the probability of failure. As uh, these limits increase, that is reflected in the probability of failure and the result uh, from sequential SRSM it matches with the MCS result. And not only that, you can also compare the number of function calls. In case of Monte Carlo simulations, 10 to the power 5 samples are used. Now, if you have a finite element model like this, uh, uh, for Monte Carlo simulation, we need to solve it for a large number of samples. As you can see here, 10 to the power 5 samples. Compared to that, obviously, if first order reliability method works, that's very easy to implement. Because in that case, uh, obviously, this uh, this is an example for um, implicit performance function. 
for implicit performance function, uh, we cannot straight away adopt a first order reliability method except we evaluate gradient numerically and that's what is done here. So, uh, the same process is repeated also for some. So, we can see the number of function calls are much less compared to obviously Monte Carlo simulation. Then in HUSRSM, the number of function calls are here 4014 and then sequentially if we develop the response surface using a Hermite polynomial, uh, 2108 function calls are used. So, it's a kind of trade-off between the quality of results we get and the number of function calls. So, obviously, uh, if we can apply um, judiciously, then we can uh, get a better result. So, that's the advantage of orthogonal representation of response surface as you can uh, rightly see here. Obviously, this is uh, not generic. Uh, in some other problem, it may so happen the other method of uh, orthogonal representation, for example, using HUSRSM, that may give a better result. It's not that always uh, you'll get Hermite polynomial giving best results, but that we can easily compare because in both the cases, the function calls are much less compared to Monte Carlo simulation. So, we can easily compare these type of orthogonal representation of the uh, uh, response and then we can see for which problem uh, which uh, orthogonal polynomial provides a better response. So, the next problem in this case uh, we have a composite plate and the moment we have a composite plate these are uh, laminates as you can see and different laminates are stacked one on top of other and uh, that is how the composites are prepared. So, it is a carbon epoxy composite plate. And for that, we use FSDT theory. Uh, then uh, we also define the displacement field and uh, solve it using finite element framework. And in this case, we also consider the geometric nonlinearity. Now, uh, for the timing, I am not going into the details of that uh, geometric FEM. That is not the focus of this discussion. The only thing to be noted here is the performance function. So, in this case, again, uh, modified Zihil failure criteria is adopted and that is the performance function or limit state most popularly we call it in reliability based design. So, this is the limit state what we have y of x is 1 minus 1 is the limit minus of this uh, failure index. Now, when this value is more than 1 obviously that is a failure and in this case sigma 1 1 2 2 and 1 2 these are the laminate stresses and x y and t 1 2 they are longitudinal transverse and shear stress. So, the random variables are here. In this case, we have 9 random variables and their properties are here and in this case also they are following non-normal distribution. So, once we have that, then again we can solve using different techniques and uh, again in this case we use Monte Carlo simulation and the result from Monte Carlo simulation is the benchmark. For that, we use 10 to the power 4 samples and then again we use different techniques for this problem, again, the moment we use uh, form, we have to uh, evaluate the gradient numerically and that is the reason we need to go for some function evaluation. Then we repeat the same exercise. We use uh, a stochastic response surface and then finally sequential, that means moving least square based stochastic response surface and HUSRSM. In all the cases, we compare the results and as you can see uh, from uh, this uh, Function evaluation, you can see the number of function calls very less in case of sequential SRSM. But as I told you in the previous case, that in some uh, cases, maybe this HOSRSM is giving better results. It all depends how these functions actually map the original surface. And that is reflected here. Although in this uh, case, uh, HOSRSM demands more function calls, but the results you can see compared to uh, sequential SRSM is better. So, but again, you can also adjust the numerical uh, parameters in this modeling. So, the thing is, uh, because it is a numerical way of replicating the original limit surface, it all depends the way you actually model and some of the models give better results in some problem while the other in the, for other problems that you can see. Nevertheless, the point to be noted here the first of all, the quality of results is very close to Monte Carlo simulations, the amount of function calls and then uh, 
with that function calls you can actually um, compare uh, with the Monte Carlo simulation and find out the quality of your estimate. So the next problem again it is a different application very often we encounter in uh, structural design. So it is a plate and it has a support condition you can see here and in plane loading so you ha it has a um, tensile load and then a shear at this edge and because of that uh, there is a crack developed and for that uh, you can model it using finite element framework and then uh, you can see the crack propagation. So again uh, we will not go into the details of this uh, modeling of crack and their enrichment functions and how they act, how they are modeled. Rather we will focus mostly on the reliability part. So when we have this type of problem uh, it can actually fail in different uh, ways. It can have opening, it can have in plane shear and for that performance function is reflected here. So this is the performance function or limit state and that we have to solve. So we have a allowable uh, uh, resistance and then we have actions from the load and then uh, that that is how the this theta function appears here from the action and it actually deals with the crack propagation. So the moment we apply and then we identify these are the random variables and then in this case some of them are uniform, some of them are normal and then we also have log normal variables. Then we can model it in finite element framework and then uh, we can uh, use different uh, techniques for reliability analysis. The interesting part of this is that the moment we have this type of complex problem, first order reliability analysis not always converge. In fact, uh, this point I discussed earlier how other researchers try to improve the convergence of uh, first order reliability problem or a gradient based reliability problem. So after some certain point in this case uh, beyond 52 uh, the analysis shows that gradient based reliability analysis does not work. However uh, the meta model based reliability still works perfectly and you can compare the results and in this case again uh, if you see the uh, HOSRSM and sequential SRSM their results are very close to each other and these are the very stable methods and that we can adapt because it is uh, sequentially modeling and the quality of the result is reflected here. Again you can see the number of function calls straight away the moment we introduce sequential development of uh, this response surface the number of function calls is reduced. Now uh, also in HOSRSM uh, there are 698 function calls compared to uh, MCS it is much less and uh, of course uh, if you use uh, SRSM using uh, orthogonal polynomials but not MLS regular least square you can see if you go for higher order so in the seventh order you can just notice the number of function calls and that is the main disadvantage of uh, using uh, orthogonal polynomials in uh, least square framework because in many cases we need large number of function calls and still the results may not be that uh, great. The moment we introduce MLS based option or uh, other advanced technique as you can see here and then immediately it is reflected in the number of function calls and the quality of end result. The last problem uh, in this discussion is again the Frank's function. So this test surface we will use Earlier we solved the reliability problem. So you can see this is the Frank's function. The expression for this Frank's function is given here. And if we find out this surface where it cuts the zero line, this red line is basically the limit state. So that demarcates the limit state and on top of that limit state we can find out the MPP that we have already solved. So in this case uh, we will not uh, go for uh, finding out the MPP but uh, we will solve the second part of this Frank's uh, test surface. In this surface we have two peaks and one minimum. So if we go for identifying this uh, maxima and minima, the question is whether we can do that and if so how we can do that. Because uh, in reliability problem also uh, there may be a situation where a limit surface has multiple 
design point. The question is how we identify those multiple design points that will be explained through this problem. So, in this case, we have a two dimensional uh, problem x1 and x2 and the random variables are given here mean and standard deviation and both of them for the time being normal. So, this uh, Frank's test surface uh, is again modeled using mm, uh, sequential SRSM. Remember, we use moving least square along with harmite polynomial. So, those are the orthogonal polynomials in moving least square framework. And then, uh, if we do that, we can actually find out. So, this is our starting point. So, from that, we actually can find out the optimal point that is the global maxima. So, after the first iteration. So, we start the iteration, then we fit the surface. Obviously, in a single go, we cannot fit the complete surface. So, as we move, uh, we map the complete surface and then on top of that, uh, uh, once the surface is ready, then on top of that, we can find out the global maxima. Now, the moment we find out the first maxima, the next task will be to trace this uh, second maxima and then finally, the minima. So, for that, uh, what we do, uh, we actually introduce a barrier here because this domain is searched and for that, I will suggest all of you to go through this paper. This is a very interesting paper where it talks about how to handle multiple design point and that will be demonstrated using this Frank surface here. So, the proposal is in this paper is that the moment you identify one uh, maxima, what you do, you artificially introduce some barrier so that you don't need to search. So, that is done here. So, what we do, we just uh, we know the surface here over this domain and then we uh, put the negative value of that. That means, we now uh, from maxima make it a minima just so that the maximization algorithm does not work here because this domain is such. Now, obviously, the remaining part is the uh, global maxima here. So, that is what uh, is done through this type of barrier uh, and then using that barrier, we can one by one sequentially find out all the maxima available. So, here it is done that way and the moment we do that, it can actually uh, find out the second one. So, how to introduce that and the background theory, I will again suggest you all of you to go through this paper and you will get the details how to introduce this. Nevertheless, this numerical demonstration shows that it is indeed possible when we have a complex surface. Then, uh, once we do that, the final is actually to find out the global minimum and we can do that as well and find out the global minimum. So, that uh, completes the uh, solution of the problem. So, we identified all the maxima and minima, but uh, for that, uh, what we did is the sequential response surface. So, we have these are the support points and based on these support points, we sequentially map this complete surface and then we use this surface to find out the maxima and minimum. And uh, this is again an optimization problem because we solve for maxima and minima. Then if we have a reliability based design problem, then we can now uh, introduce uh, this surface and complete the design exercise. So, with that, let us close our discussion on different applications. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.